Hello everyone, and once again, welcome back to Toki Toy Theory, where I take a look at the toys from various Tokusatsu series, and try to figure out why they look and act the way they do. So, well, first off, I'm going to apologize for the rather long hiatus I had from the last episode. Basically, what happened is that I kind of put the series on hold indefinitely, because I was getting a lot of different things, and so I wanted to take a look at them all, and I didn't really find the time for this other series. But now that things have slowed down... I'm going to be getting back to it, and it's a good thing, too, because this is going to be my most intensive look so far as I take a look at the Kamen Rider Gaim series, which not only has the most writers and forms out of any series I've looked at so far, but also has a lot of different cultural aspects to look into, so I definitely have my work cut out for me. So, as usual with these first episodes for any different series, I'm going to be taking a look at the basics. In this case, I'm going to be looking at kind of the basic concepts for the series, as well as Kamen Rider Gaim, the main writer, and his base form. So, without further ado, let's begin. So, to start, we're going to look at the main belt for the series, the Sengoku Driver. This is the belt used by what I'm going to call the first generation armored riders, who use the standard type lock seeds. The buckle has a very simple design, consisting of a translucent blue body with a silver rim around it and this small knife called the cutting blade attached to the side it has simple yellow belt straps and a belt stopper that resembles a lock with a keyhole now this only is part of the overall process of activating the transformations as this is basically just an activator now the other part of it is the face plates different face plates or rider indicators are what are used to distinguish the belt between the different riders they each plug onto the side here and then show that rider's face as well as a design motif for them. Now there are four different main types for the faceplates. The first are the Japanese style faceplates for riders with Japanese motifs like Gaim. European style, like Baron, Chinese style, like Ryugen, and what I'm just going to call other style, like, well, Bravo. No, their effects don't really come into play until you attach a lock seed. But they'll come when I get to the different riders and their different lock seeds. Speaking of which, next we'll look at the key item for the series, the lock seeds. These are padlocks, each with a fruit or nut design on them that the riders use to transform and access different forms. Now for the standard lock seeds, most of them have a pretty similar design for the base, with a silver front, a grey back, and a black hanger, though the activation or unlocking switches differ between the different lock seeds. This is Gaim's main lock seed, the orange lock seed, which is LS07, and each one is numbered. They actually go by an in-series ranking system rather than by their order of use. Now, for most lock seeds, pressing the button on the back will activate the battle game, which is meant to simulate the invest game used in the show, mostly during the beginning part of the series. And locking a lock seed will have it say its name. Next, we'll take a look at the functionality between the lock seeds in conjunction with the Sengoku driver. 
So the transformation process starts out pretty simply by attaching the lock seed via unlocking it, then placing it on. Then once we lock it down, we'll we see the effects of the different faceplates, which are the uh, transformation standbys as well as the sounds made by the cutting blade. To activate the transformation, you lower the cutting blade and slice open the fruit. And here when we get the basic concept of the Sengoku driver, which is that it's supposed to be a cutting board, and the loxies are obviously fruits that you cut open using the cutting blade. And so herein we see the inside of a lock seed, which comes in two parts. The top part, which is designed to look like the inside of its given fruit, and the bomb part, which displays its arm's weapon. Afterwards, all other functions are also done by the cutting blade. Depending on how many times you lower it afterwards, will it will activate one of three different attacks. The first attack is a squash, which is the basic finisher attack. Second is an Ole attack, which is an energy-based attack. And third is Sparking, which is a super finisher move. Next we'll look at Gaim himself so we can get an idea of the basic template for the Armored Riders, which is that they come in two different parts, being the rider themselves and then their arms, which take the form of a metal fruit. So for each rider, they have a pretty simple bodysuit, usually each with a different kind of standard design depending on what kind of rider they are, with the helmets being unique to each. For Gaim's helmet, it bears a Crescent Moon Samurai Helmet Crest, similar to the one of Masamune Date. Going down to the body, it has some adornments to the shoulders, cross-hat padding for the upper body, and a cloud design on the forearms and thighs, as well as some standard guards on the backs of the hands, as well as the elbows, knees, and shins, which is uniform to all of the armored riders. Now, Gaim is unique as, unlike other riders, he has a lock seat holder that he can use to hang on, hang on to his different lock seeds, so he can switch between forms at a moment's notice. He also has a holster here on the side, which we'll get to its purpose later. Next we have our first look at an arms, is the orange arms. So like I said, each one takes the form of a metal fruit. And the idea being that the fruit kind of determines what kind of armor the rider will get, since the concept is based on attaching the armor to their heads and then unpeeling it to form armor. So based on that, they kind of determine what kind of armor it will be, just going by how said fruit unpeels, or just how it peels in general. And here we have Gaim's base form, Orange Arms, wherein he becomes a samurai. So as you can see, the uh, peeled parts of the orange fold in on themselves on the front and sides to form a chest plate and shoulder pads. Then the back plate hangs off right here. And this is definitely how uh, Samurai Armor was designed. 
They even went to the point of having ropes for that little bit of extra accuracy since samurai armor was usually held together using ropes like this. It also adds a new part to complete the back of the helmet. And depending on which arms a rider is using, it also changes the inside of the visor to look like the inside of that fruit. So, for Gaim in orange arms, his visor now becomes a, an orange slice. Not only that, but while the armor still does look like that of the given warrior, it still has detail to give off the elements of it being based on fruit, such as all these studs, which look like the texture of an orange, or kind of give it an orange-like texture. In the orange arms, Daim is equipped with two weapons, the Dai Dai Maru and the Musou Saber. Now, the Musou Saber is a standard weapon that he can use in any form, while the Dai Dai Maru is his arms weapon, and since there are deluxe versions of these two, we'll look at them more using those toys. So, here are the Dai Dai Maru and the Musou Saber. So with the Dai Dai Maru, we can get a basic idea of what they're going for with the arms weapons. Which is the simple concept of taking the fruit that is used for their arms, and instead of turning it into armor, this time turning it into a weapon. So in this case, the Dai Dai Maru takes an orange slice and then turns it into a sword. And that works out pretty well because you can see the inner part of the orange here, with the peel becoming the blade. They even went to the detail or put in enough effort to even have it have a guard or tsubu right here. And as can be seen, each arms weapon has pretty simple functionality and it can uh, perform a special attack all on its own, though often in the series they're powered up using the Sengoku driver. On the other hand, we have the standard weapon for Gaim, the Muso Saber. Now this is an interesting weapon because it's part sword, part gun. And the idea of having two swords is something that is actually part of samurai culture and it's called the Dai Sho consisting of a daito, or a big sword, and a shoto, or a small sword. Though these two are around the same size, but it still goes along with that idea. And the concept of having a gun be part of his main weapon kind of goes along with how in the Sengoku period, that was around the time where firearms were first introduced to the Japanese by Western traders. And it can pretty simply switch between acting as a sword or acting as a gun. Now, uh, the uh, Muso Saber is what I like to call a lock weapon. As unlike the arms weapons, this is a uh, special weapon that can interact with the lock seeds. This is done by placing on a lock seed, locking it down, and then activating it using the trigger. And each lock seed, of course, has a different sound when used with the Muso Saber. What's also special is that the Musa Saber and Dai Dai Maru can combine to form the Musa Saber Naginata mode. Now, uh, this is uh, called Naginata mode, but it's not quite what an actual Naginata is, as a Naginata is a pole arm with a blade attached to the end. Though a lot of times in Tokusatsu, Naginatas are uh, portrayed as pole arms with two blades, but from what I've seen, there's never actually been a historical evidence of Naginata with 
one blade at each end. We'll get into what something like that is really called in a later video. The idea is that this powers up the Musa Saber so it gives it different attacks. It also makes the interaction with the Lock Seeds more powerful. said and done, everything can convert back to normal. And there we go. As one final note, I just wanted to point out how the Musa Saber just holds it on the side of Gain's belt when not in use. But besides that, we can now kind of see some of the basic concepts that they're going for within the Gain series. And the main one that sticks out to me is different uses of fruits. With the first ones we see being them turned into locks and being sliced open by the Sengoku driver. The second one is them being turned into armor for the rider's forms. And the third one is them being turned into weapons for the arms weapons. And as we go along we will see more creative uses of the fruit in terms of how it's turned into armor or how it turns into weapons. Since the lock seeds are generally a lot of kind of the same thing with different designs. But you can definitely see that we are getting into some interesting territory here and it really will in the long run kind of go to show how creative Bandai can get with their concepts. And so from here on in I'm going to uh, do things a little bit in regards to uh, necessity. Basically, for the next part of the Toy Toy Theory, I'm going to look at some of Gaim's other form changes. Then I'm going to look at a couple of riders on their own. Then I'm going to be doing a few videos uh, interspersed through the series where I look at multiple riders in the same video, since a lot of riders only have one form. And I'll, of course, be kind of interjecting Gaim's power up forms where I see fit. It might seem a little bit jumbled, but there kind of is a reasoning to that to it and it's basically just I'm kind of going about this in regards to the series progression but anyway I guys I hope you guys enjoyed this and I hope you guys will enjoy the uh, upcoming episodes and I promise that once I finish with the Gaim series I will make sure that it doesn't take too long to move on to drive so next time I'll be reviewing the ghost icons for Kamen Rider Double through Kamen Rider Drive. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and or subscribe. And you can check me out on Facebook at facebook.com slash krx50. And for now, this is krx50, riding off.